Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and we are diving deep into Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, Chapter 4. Let's get started. Chapter four, overcoming time. So much has been written about the importance of staying present. I could cite statistics on everything from distracted driving to divorce to support the notion that people have a really hard time staying in the present moment. Let me add to that body of knowledge by expressing this concept in quantum terms. In the present, all potentials exist simultaneously in the field. So when we stay present, when we are in the moment, we can move beyond time and space. So I want to repeat that because I think that's a very critical distinction. I think we really need to pay close attention to. I could cite statistics on everything from distracted driving to divorce to support the notion that people have a really hard time staying in the present moment. Let me add to that body of knowledge by expressing this concept in quantum terms. In the present, all potentials exist simultaneously in the field. When we stay present, when we are in the moment, we can move beyond space and time and we can make any of those potentials a reality. So I want to pause right here because this is a very big distinction. For those of you who are familiar with the law of one, one of the things that Ra says in those teachings is that our access, our gateway portal, the way that we're able to tap into infinite source intelligence and the divine in essence is through the self mastery of on purpose quieting the mind and as you quiet the mind because that is the mind's intention is to be in that quiet to be in the void that it is through that portal that then you're able to tap into infinite source intelligence and you're able to also discover all the different unlimited potentials that ex that exist in that field and that is the corridor the gateway the door dr joe likes to say you know we're knocking on that door when we're doing the meditations he gives us prompting does to okay now we're going to get to that door and at that door you're going to knock the door and you're going to want to open that door and it's that point where you're in theta state because the whole goal is for you to actually first get into theta state and, they, and the way you do that is through the breath, because that's how you are going to move your, your cerebrospinal fluid, and you're going to start, start to charge your body and create that inductance field. When you do that induction, you're fanning out your energy. As you fan out your electromagnetic field and your toroidal field now grows, however far you're able to expand it. Now you're able to tap into that infinite source of intelligence because you're going into the void. You are no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, in no time. You are not the individual. Oh, it looks like we've got somebody joining us here. Aaron, oh, it's like we got somebody else here. Fantastic, welcome to the broadcast, Aaron. So as I was saying, when you get into the void and when you get into that corridor of where you're able to tap into infinite source intelligence, the portal, the corridor, like Dr. Joe says, the door that you're gonna be knocking on is the door of quantum. And the way to access that is through the breath. Through the breath is the mechanical, it's the mechanical application that you are choosing to do in order to electromagnetically charge, not only your cerebral spinal fluid, because it is going to touch touch your pineal gland, which I actually have a little 
prop today that I can share with you to show you. This is the pineal gland looks very much like a little pine cone. You see that? That's what our pineal gland looks like. Actually, it looks, have it right side up instead of upside down. So that is what our pineal gland looks like, except it is the size of our ice grain. And as we electromagnetically increase the charge of our, of our cerebral spinal fluid, as we start to bring up the breath and we, where you put your focus is where you put your energy. So when you put your focus and your attention on the first energy center at the base of your perineum and you start to inhale and bring it up from the first to the second to the third to the fourth, open up your heart with unconditional love because that's the fuel that gets us connected to quantum and then bring it up to your fifth energy center to the sixth energy center, which is obviously your pineal gland. And then you get to your pituitary and then you hit the eighth energy center. And then you're gonna cause that piezoelectric effect. And you're starting to get the calcium carbonate crystals. There's five of them that sit like rhombohedrons on top of this pineal gland. They're paper thin. They're like two to 20 microns or tiny. We talked about that in Becoming Supernatural. And so this is how we're able to, on purpose, tune in, tap in, and turn on to that infinite source of intelligence. So when we are mired in the past, however, none of those new potentials exist. Sidebar, because you're basically stuck in a sliver of time that already has taken place. But in quantum, past, present, future, and all of your potentials exist in that 5D quantum. Remember, by you having your conscious awareness and using your free will to focus on a potential that changes the energy waves at the atomic level. Now they're potential waveforms of energy. Now just by your focusing on a potential that starts to turn them into particles. So now you have one particle, two particle, three particles. They start to, the longer you focus on it, the more particles start to build up until there's enough that creates enough critical mass where boom, you have a tipping point where then it's expressed on the outside in 3D. So when we are mired in the past, however, none of those new potentials exist. You have learned that when human beings try to change, we react much like addicts because we become addicted to our familiar chemical states of being you know that when you have an addiction, it is almost as if your body has a mind of its own. As past events trigger the same chemical response as the original incident, your body thinks it's ex re-experiencing the same event. Once conditioned to be the subconscious mind through this process, the body has taken over for the mind. It has become the mind and therefore can, in a sense, think. So I want to pause right here because what you have done all your life is that you have used your brain to file catalog, catalog and archive every memory you've had conscious and unconscious because of the memories that you've had, because of the thoughts that you've had, you've had an emotional response to people, places, things, circumstances, and certain events. And then the emotions have been logged in the body the body is the filing cabinet, if you will, for those past emotions. So Dr. Joe always says, thoughts are the language of the brain. Feelings and emotions are the language of the body. So if you recall in chapter, I think it was two of Becoming Supernatural, I talked about my experience of doing the challenge during my first time at the monastery with Dr. Joe in Cancun and how 50 feet up in the air, all of a sudden, I felt like my, my body was betraying me because my legs started shaking. You can watch that video at the end here. Uh, I talk a little bit about that experience. But I wasn't thinking I was scared. I thought I had overcome the, the thought of fear as I was climbing up the stairs because I had to psych myself out and I had to distinguish my brain, my ego from my free will, my choice of awareness and where I was gonna focus it. And so if I would have not halted that process and I would have allowed my legs to shake and I would have given more attention to the shaking legs, and of course it would have given 
way to an even greater amount of fear because more fear thoughts create more fear emotions, which would have caused more, maybe it wouldn't have stopped at my legs trembling. Maybe it would have also been my whole body would have been trembling, which in the, at that case, I would, I would think, I would imagine it would be almost impossible to balance on that eye beam. That's not what we want. I don't want to be addicted to that feeling. That feels horrible. I don't want to ever have to go through that again. So that is showing me it's biofeedback. It's also that particular time. And I've used that so many times since then to master myself and to recognize that my awareness is here. So you're aware and then you take your free will and you choose to focus on that, which it is that you want. So now you tell your brain, oh, no, I'm going to, You've been the master for way too long. My awareness now, I am the master, you are the servant. Ego, you're not my amigo, you're my enemigo. We're gonna put you, we're gonna put you away. You're a path, you're you're a has-been. You served your purpose. I get why you're there. You're there to shed light. You know, you're the shadow side. You're letting me shine brighter as the real true me. So thank you for being there for contrast. So you make it possible for me to shine even brighter, I put you away, you're serving a purpose. And now brain, you do as I say, no, this is where we're focusing on all of our attention, all of our energy, all the cells of my body, my autonomic nervous system, I want it to create whatever combination of, of you know, my body can create up to 140,000 different chemicals for the 23,688 genes that I have in my body. So infinite intelligence, divine, you know what combination is optimal to optimize my body, go at it. And then I just see myself in the perfect state of being where I'm happy, joyful, in gratitude and appreciation, and then I let it go. So I just touch upon how the body becomes the mind by the cycle of thinking and feeling, feeling and thinking. But there is another way in which this occurs based on past memories. So here's this, this is how it works. You have an experience which has an emotional charge. So when you have a thought about a particular past event, the thought becomes a memory, which then reflexively reproduces the emotion of that experience. So if you keep thinking about the memory repeatedly, the thought, the memory, and the emotion merge as one. And so when you memorize the emotion. So now living in the past becomes less of a conscious process and more of a subconscious one. So figure 4A in your books, the thought produces a memory, which in turn creates an emotion. In time, the thought becomes a memory and an emotion follows. So if this process is repeated enough time, the thought is the memory, which is the emotion. We memorize the emotion. So the subconscious, we memorize the emotion. So the subconscious comprises most physical and mental processes that take place below our conscious awareness. But much of this activity is involved in keeping the body functioning. So scientists refer to this regulatory system as the autonomic nervous system, also known as the ANS system or the ANS. We don't have to consciously think about breathing keep our hearts beating, raising and lowering our body temperature, or any of the other millions of processes that help the body maintain order and heal itself. So I think that you can see how potentially dangerous it is for us to cede control over daily emotional responses to our memories and environment. So to this automatic system, this subconscious set of routine responses has been variously compared to an autopilot system and to programs running in the background of a computer. So what those analogies are trying to convey is a sense that there is something below the surface of our actual awareness that is in control of how we actually behave. So that here's an example to reinforce these points. Imagine that you are in your youth, you came home one day and discovered your favorite pet lying dead on the floor. Every sensory impression of that experience would be, as the expression goes, burned into your brain. That experience would scar you. 
with traumatic experiences like that, it's easy to understand how those emotions can become unconscious, memorized responses to reminders from your environment that you lost a loved one. So you know by now that when you think about that experience, you create the same emotions in your brain and body as if the event was occurring all over again. All it takes is one stray thought or one reaction to some event in the external world to activate that program. And you start feeling the emotion of your past grief. So the trigger could be seeing a dog that looks like yours or visiting a place you once took him as a puppy. Regardless of the sensory input, it activates that emotion. Those emotional triggers can be obvious or very, very subtle, but they all affect you at a subconscious level. And before you can process what has happened, you're back in the emotional chemical state of grief, anger, sadness. So once that happens, the body now is running the mind. You can use your conscious mind to try to get out of that emotional state but invariably you feel like you're out of control. So think of Pavlov and his dogs in the 19, actually in the 1890s, the young Russian scientist strapped a few dogs to a table, rang a bell and then fed the canines a hearty meal. So over time, after repeatedly exposing the dogs to the same stimuli, he simply rang the bell and the dogs automatically salivated just in anticipation. So this is called a conditioned response. So, and the process occurs automatically. So why? Because the body begins to respond automatically and think of our autonomic nervous system, the cascade of chemical reactions that is triggered within moments, changes the body physiologically. And it happens quite subconsciously with little or no conscious effort. I'm gonna pause here for a moment because I'm sure all of us have had the experience where somebody started to talk about uh, maybe you visualizing. In fact, you might wanna do this right now where you just take a moment and I want you to just think about taking a lemon and I want you to think about slicing that lemon in half and you see the spray of the zest of the lemon peel squirt out as you chop it. Then I want you to take one half of that lemon and I want you to take the lemon and in your mind's eye, I want you to squeeze that lemon into your mouth. Just talking about that right now, how many of you are starting to feel like a puckering and you start to salivate just from the thought of the tardiness of that lemon juice being squirted into your mouth? It's making my mouth water just as I'm talking to you guys here. It's kind of funny, but it's an imaginary process we just went through. It just took a few seconds and yet the body doesn't know any different. It thinks that it's actually experiencing that in this time. And so we have all had experiences in our past, experiences that range from anger and grief to joy, bliss, and ecstasy. It ranges the gamut and all of the emotions that are associated with every one of those experiences is logged and filed away in this filing cabinet that we call our bodies. And so as we think of those events, as we think of those memories, it's almost like your body is like the catch on a computer so that you can get to whatever website, whatever it is that you're looking for online, it can get there quicker because it saves the algorithms in the computer so that it can get there faster next time. So it keeps kind of like a little phantom copy in the background. Your body is the same way. So now you can get to that emotional response even faster, more efficiently, because it's already registered in your body. Your body doesn't have to create that from scratch. It's not a first time emotional response. It's a conditioned response. The second you have the memory, boom, there's the emotional response. Does that make sense? So this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to change. If you've wondered, here's your answer. The conscious mind may be in the present, 
but the subconscious mind body the body mind is living in the past if we begin to expect a predictable future event to occur in reference to a memory of the past we are just like those canines one experience of a particular person or thing at a specific time and place from the past automatically or autonomically causes us to respond physiologically. So once we break the emotional addictions rooted in our past, there will no longer be any pull to cause us to return to the same automatic programs of the old self. It begins to make sense that although we think and we believe we are living in the present, there's a good possibility that our bodies are in the past. And I would argue that if our body is in the past, then your brain is in the past. So you're not, you're not present, you're really asleep. You're going off of conditioned responses. You're not really thinking twice about it. You're just, you're reacting. Instead of being proactive, you're being reactive. You're really out of control. If you, if you really sit there and analyze what it is that you're allowing your body to do and what you're allowing your brain to do, you're out of control, which I think is why many people do feel out of control. And now they have this overwhelming need to control others, people, places, and things. I mean, I just heard again today of someone who I think, I think they just have two grandkids and his idea he only has one daughter and when his when he passes away his intention is yes to leave whatever he has to those two grand grandkids and it's in the millions but he's not going to let them touch it till they're 35 years old so from the grave he's trying to control these two individuals and i'm like why what what's the point of that you know that was not done to you why are you putting that on somebody else it's not exact it's not a smart thing it's not a loving thing it's not um it doesn't make any sense to me and yet but you know what to each his own it's none of my business what do i care but it's peculiar but that's obviously it's a an outward reach trying to control even in your absence of being here on the planet you're still trying to exercise control over people i'm thinking how sad what a waste of energy can you imagine how much more you could do to make your body feel better to create a jubilant you know a happy ecstatic fun exciting life adventures you know just there's so many things on this planet to do oh my gosh so Moving on, next part in the book here, emotions to moods to temperaments, two personality traits conditioning the body to live in the past. Unfortunately for most of us, because the brain always works by repetition and association, it doesn't take a major trauma to produce the effect of the body becoming the mind. The most minor triggers can produce emotional responses that feel as though they are beyond our control. So for instance, you're driving to work and you stop at your usual coffee place and which is all out of your favorite hazelnut coffee disappointed you grumbled to yourself why a major enterprise like this one can't keep in stock such a popular flavor I'm gonna pause right here right now as of the recording as of this live broadcast we are still during the quarantine and the pand pandemic global pandemic that's going on because we are towards the end of the month we're actually it's may 25th so we are still in this pandemic so a lot of places right now are running low on this that and whatnot so under normal circumstances that's not normally the case in most stores but right now we have a lot of this going on so i could see this happening to a lot of people so at work, you're irritated to see another car in your preferred parking spot. Stepping into an empty elevator, you are exasperated to discover that someone ahead of you pushed all the buttons. I think that's actually funny. When you finally walk into the office, someone comments, what's up? You seem kind of down. You tell your story and the person sympathizes. You sum it up. I'm in a bad mood. 
I'll get over it. The thing is, <laughs> you don't. A mood is a chemical state of being, generally short term. That is an expression of a prolonged emotional reaction. Something in your environment, something outside of you, in this case, the failure of your barista to meet your needs, followed by a few other minor annoyances, sets off an emotional response. The chemicals of that emotion don't get used up instantly, so their effect lingers for a while. I call that the refractory period. The time after their initial release and until the effect diminishes, the longer the refractory period, obviously, the longer you experience those feelings. When the chemical refractory period of an emotional reaction lasts for hours to days, that's a mood. So what happens when that recently triggered mood lingers? You've been in a bit of a funk since that day, since that day. And now you look around the room during a staff meeting and all you think of is that this person's tie is hideous and the nasally tone of your boss is worse than nails on a chalkboard. At this point, you're not just in a mood. You're reflecting a temperament, a tendency toward the habitual expression of an emotion through a certain behaviors. A temperament is an emotional reaction with a refractory period that lasts from weeks, two months, and in some cases, years. Eventually, if you keep the refractory period of an emotion going for months and years, that tendency turns into a personality trait. At that point, others will describe you as bitter, resentful, or angry, or judgmental, or whatever. Our personality traits then are frequently based in our past emotions. Most of the time, personality, how we think, act, and feel, is anchored in the past. So to change our personalities, we have to change the emotions that we memorize. We have to move out of the past. Figure 4B. Now, I don't recall if in this book Dr. Joe talks about it, but I know that there's plenty of, of research out there and scientists have actually shown that when you actually have a feeling or an emotion, let's say of anger, that it only lasts for like 90 seconds in your bloodstream and then it dissipates. So any anger that you continue to feel beyond the 90 minute, let's call it two minutes just to be generous. Anything, any negative feeling that you're feeling beyond two minutes, you're faking it. What you're doing is you are using your thoughts to keep you in an angry state, to keep on producing the chemical reaction of anger and toxicity in, my, in your blood, I might add. And you, you're doing the scratch record feedback loop to keep yourself, you're, you're keeping yourself angry, angrier than you need to be because you're choosing to dwell on whatever it is that you perceive is making you, no one makes you anything, but you perceive that whatever it is, it's making you angry. Think about that for a second. How many people do you know that are mad because we've been in this quarantine since the first week of March and they've been in a, <laughs> they've been in a funk, they've been in a depression, they've been in a mood, they've been snippety, they've been angry, they've been depressed, they've been, you fill in the blank. Instead of looking at the glass as half, being half full, no, they're looking at what they don't have, what they're missing out on. That's where their focus and attention is. It's no wonder that if you keep on focusing on lack, more is going to be taken away from you. You're going to, it's like going down a toilet bowl. You just, it's just not going to get better. It's just going to go infinitely worse going down. For those of us who choose not to go down that route, and instead you look at the positive, you look at the silver lining on the cloud, you look at the half full glass in the chance, and wow, there's so many possibilities from so many sources to fill up the rest of this cup. Oh my gosh, not only is my cup not just half full, it is full, heck, it's actually now overflowing. Imagine that. But that is a chosen, proactive measure as opposed to a reactive 
measure. Notice how the word reactive, that means that you're reacting. You're acting again and again and again in the same way instead of taking a proactive towards whatever it is that you want. The clues are in the words, my friends and gems. I've been saying it all along. The clues are in the words. So figure 4B, the progression of different refractory periods. An experience actually creates an emotional reaction, which then in turn can turn into a mood and then into a temperament and finally into a personality trait. We as personalities memorize our emotional reaction and live in the past. I'm going to hit the buzz button here because I had a friend, I've actually had several friends who've had this issue, but I had one friend in particular that his mother passed away and um, he was very close to his mother, was not close to his father at all. When his mother passed away, he was completely devastated. When she died, a piece of him died. And it was really, really sad because he, I understand losing a parent. I mean, I've never lost a mother or a father, knock on wood, thank goodness I haven't had to experience that yet. But I know what it's like to lose a loved one. You know, I've lost, you know, the closest aunt that, you know, uh, my whole life I was just the closest to her. I, I lost her when I was in college. It was, um, you know, that was very devastating. Um, so I've lost people that are very, very close to me. Some of them expectedly, others unexpectedly. You know, just this month of March, I lost four people in the month of March, none of them to COVID. The youngest one was only 18 months old. That little cherub went to heaven. That was devastating. Now back to my friend that I was telling you about, he lost his mother and he never really recovered from the loss of his mother. So instead of celebrating the 80 plus, I think she was 84 or 85 years old when she passed and she died of a sudden heart attack, even though she'd been battling heart conditions for the last several years, she died of a sudden heart attack, lived, lived a full joyous, she was the most, one of the most joyous, um, she just had a wonderful, very intuitive spirit. She was just a really neat lady. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to know her. But when she died, a piece of him died. He went into a deep, dark depression from which he never really recovered. And I think he was like 57 or 58 when she passed. And within two years, not even two years of her passing, he died on the anniversary of her second um, anniversary death date. And so how sad that he could have lived a life of joy. And yeah, you, you, you grieve, you allow that process to move on, but then you let it go. Instead of celebrating the 84 years that she brought so much joy to so many people on the planet, he chose to focus on the day and the hour that she passed away. And rather than honoring her life, he dishonored, in my opinion, he dishonored her life because he focused just on the moment. Her whole life was defined by, by the moment in which she passed away, instead of all the amazing magical things that she did throughout her life. And I'm thinking, wow, what a disservice. You know, that's to me, it's not the highest healthiest expression of love for another. I want to celebrate. And you know, my grandparents are both gone on both sides. I didn't really know my parents, my mother's parents, but my father's parents, I got to live with them for three years. So I got to know them very well. Oh my gosh, my grandmother and my grandfather, I don't define them by the day in which they died. They were such incredible human beings. I was so blessed to live with them for three years. I got to know them really well. I cherish the memories that I had with my grandparents during that time and after that time, because my relationship was so much richer with them because I lived with them for three years. So are you going to dwell on the fact that you lost a parent, lost a child, lost, and I, I lost a child, my first child, you know, before my oldest was born, I lost one prior to that. Now, can you imagine how different my my three kids' lives would be if I were to be sucking wind because I lost that first one? Why should I discount their lives and define that other life just by the moment of loss? How many of you have been stuck on 
you can't win all the battles and win the war. In life, you have to choose how you're going to manage and focus your energy. So pick your battles so that you can win the ultimate war. There's a lot of things that are pulling for your attention nowadays. Always has, always will be, always has been and always will be. So do you want to keep on running the past and use that as an excuse to be sucking wind today? You know, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Add a little sugar, add a little water, and now you got a cup of lemonade. If life is throwing you, pardon my French, and yes, I'm going to use not the nicest, sweetest, most beautiful word, but you know what? If life throws you shit, we all get shit thrown to us at one point or another. It happens. So take that, mix it up with a little dirt, and use it for fertilizer so that you can plant something and grow because that shit is useful. And if you feel like you're down in a ditch right now because things haven't gone your way, those things that haven't gone your way are just a course redirect. It is trying to get you on the right path. If you lost a job, if you lost a spouse, if you lost whatever it is that you feel that you have lost, those things, it's trying to adjust you so that you're paying attention in the right direction. Don't look at this closed door. If you have a closed door literally right in front of you, do a 360. If you keep on, I doubt you do, you're going to do a 360 and come back to that closed door again. You will find at least one, two, or three other open doors. And then if you are lucky enough to have two or three open doors, pick one. It doesn't matter which of the three. If you are so afraid of picking the wrong one, you can't pick a wrong one. If it's an open door, open a door, pick one. You can't go through all three of them at the same time. So pick one, go, if one of the, I had a, I'll never forget the first time somebody told me this. There was something that I had some sort of dilemma about back in 2012. And the way it was language to me, I thought this is brilliant. I'm gonna use this from this point forward. So this is a gem. I hope that if nothing else you take away from this chapter, that you take this away from you. So if you find yourself stuck, unable to decide, maybe you have more than one opportunity. Maybe you have more than one job opportunity. Maybe you have more than one, one, more than one person to date or what, more than one love interest in your life. Maybe you have more than one, uh, maybe you have two or three different solutions to a problem at work or to a challenge in your business. That's great news. The world, the universe is showing you abundance and prosperity that instead of just giving you just barely one, it's giving two, three or more. So take them all into account. And if you can't figure out which one's the right one, which one's wrong, and you're afraid of making the wrong choice, let's say, okay, choice number one, does this feel lighter or darker to me? Nah, doesn't. I don't feel that it's lighter. It feels a little darker. Okay, process of elimination. Option two, does this feel lighter or darker? Oh, wow, this one feels a lot. I never thought of it that way. This feels lighter in weight to me than the other one. The other one felt darker. Okay, this is a possibility. Let me check option three. And then option three, you're like, oh, this feels really heavy or really dark to me. Oh, okay, obviously, it's just the second option that feels light, either light in terms of light, like that light right there, or as in weight, either one. Which one feels lighter? Which one feels darker and heavier? I remember the first time I heard that. Oh, the answer was so obvious for me. It was black and white, no pun intended. Maybe. Maybe that's the only reason why you're supposed to be watching this video is to get that particular answer, that particular strategy. I don't know. Only you know, but you have the power to choose how you move forward from this moment in time. You can either keep on reacting or you can be proactive. The choice is yours. You have the free will to do whatever you want. So we as personalities memorize our emotional reaction and live in the past. So we can't change when living in a predictable future. Wow. And I, if there's, aside from the addiction to fear, 
because some people are very, very addicted to fear. But I see that be, one of the manifestations of being addicted to fear is wanting to predict the future. Well, no one can predict the future. However, better than predicting the future is creating the future that you want. When you create the future that you want, you don't have to predict the future because you know what life's coming attractions are going to be because you have a whole slew of things that you've put your deposit, you've created in 5D quantum and know that you have all these juicy surprises that they're going to pop into your 3D manifestation and reveal themselves to you in the way of people, places, things, opportunities, surprises, unexpected events, serendipity, coincidences, and more signs and more. Moving on. So there is yet another way that we get stuck and keep ourselves from changing. We may also train the body to be the mind in order to live in a predictable future based on the memory of the known past. And thus we miss the precious now moment again. So as you know, we can condition the body to live in the future. Of course, that can be a means to change our lives for the better when we make a conscious fo choice to focus on a desired new experience, as my daughter did when she created her summer job in Italy. As her story demonstrates, if we focus on an intended future event and then plan how we will prepare or behave, there will be a moment when we are so clear and focused on that possible future that the thoughts we are thinking will begin to become the experience itself. Once the thought becomes the experience, it's an, its end product is an emotion. When we begin to experience the emotion of that event ahead of its possible occurrence, the body as the unconscious mind begins to respond as though the event is actually unfolding. On the other hand, what happens if we begin to anticipate some unwanted future experience or even obsess about a worst case scenario based on a memory from our past, we are still programming the body to experience a future event before it occurs. So now the body is no longer in the moment or in the past. It is living in the future, but a future based on some construct of the past. So when this occurs, the body does not know the difference between an actual event transpiring in reality and what we are entertaining mentally. So because we are priming it to be juiced up for whatever we think might be coming, the body begins to get ready, starts to get tense. And in a very real way, the body is in the event already. So here's an example of living in the future based on the past. Imagine that you've been asked to give a lecture in front of 350 people, but you fear being on stage based on memories of previous public speaking disasters from your distant past. Whenever you think about the coming talk, you envision yourself standing there stammering and losing your train of thought. Your body begins to respond as if that future event is unfolding now. Your shoulders tense, your heart races, and you perspire heavily. And as you anticipate that dreaded day, you cause your body to already be living in that stressful reality, caught up in that obsessed with, you're like obsessed with this possibility of failing. Again, you are so intent on that expected reality that you can't concentrate on anything else. Your mind and body are polarized, moving from the past to the future and back again. As a result, you deny yourself the novelty of a wonderful future outcome. As a more universal example of living in a predictable future, let's say that for many years, you wake up to each to a new day, only to slide automatically into a same old set of unconscious actions. The body is so used to anticipating performing your daily behaviors that it goes almost mechanically from one task to the next. There's feeding the dog, brushing your teeth, putting on your clothes, making tea, taking the garbage out, getting the mail. You get the idea. Although you may wake up with a thought to do something different, somehow you find yourself doing the same old, same old things as if you were just along for the ride. After you have memorized these types of actions for a decade or two or three, your body has been trained to continuously look forward 
to doing these things. So in fact, it's been subconsciously programmed to live in the future and thus allow, it's gonna allow you to sleep behind the wheel. We could even say that you're no longer even driving the car. Now your body cannot exist in the present moment. It is primed to control you by running a host of unconscious programs. While you sit back and allow it, oh, we got another guest here. Welcome Natalia and Aaron. So now your body cannot exist in the present moment. It is primed to control you by running a host of unconscious programs while you sit back and allow it to head toward some humdrum known destiny. So overcoming your nearly automatic habits and no longer anticipating the future requires the ability to live greater than time. More on that to come. So living in the past, which is your future. I want you to hear that again. Living in the past, which is your future. So if you're living in the past, which is living your future, you're never really enjoying and savoring this very moment in time, which means that you don't love yourself enough to be present in the now. How sad is that? So really, if you really think about it, if you really feel what it is that we just read, the most loving state of being is to be in unconditional love where you are fully aware of the present now and you are embracing loving thoughts towards yourself in the present now, knowing that all potentials exist in 5D when you are no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, in no time. And as you future cast and you start to program and download into 5D what it is that you want, you can be really happy in the now because you know all the, you know all the juicy, yummy things that you have put in order, you've commanded in 5D, so you know it's coming. It's a done deal. The when, you have no idea. The how, those two things are surprises. You're not attached to when, you know it's done. It's as good as, you can take it to the bank. And now you can just focus on creating more. That is a pretty rock star lifestyle place to be. Wouldn't you agree? So living in the past, which is your future. Here's another example that demonstrates how familiar emotions create a corresponding future. So you were invited to a coworker's 4th of July barbecue and everyone from your department is expected to attend. You don't like the host. He's always number one and he doesn't mind letting everybody know it. Every time he's hosted an event before, you wound up having a miserable time. With this guy pushing every single one of your buttons as you're driving to his place now, all you can think about is how at the last party he interrupted everyone's meal so he could present his wife with a new BMW. Oh my gosh. You're certain as you've told your partner the whole week leading up to the cookout that this is going to be one miserable day. Oh, wow. And it becomes exactly that. You run a stop sign and get a ticket. One of your coworkers spills a beer on your pants and shirt. The hamburger that you requested be done medium well comes to you barely beyond raw. Given your attitude and your state of being going in, how could you have expected things to turn out any other way? You woke up anticipating that this day was slated to be a horror show and it turned out that way. You alternated between obsessing about an unwanted future, anticipating what would come next. You woke up anticipating this day was slated to be a horror show and it turned out that way. You alternated between obsessing about an unwanted future, anticipating what would come next, comparing stimuli you were receiving to what you previously received. So you created more of the same. If you start keeping track of your thoughts and write them down, you'll find that most of the time you are either thinking ahead or looking back. So if you're constantly looking forward or constantly looking back, when are you going to be? That's a distinction. That is part of the secret that Dr. Joe is trying to reveal to us. We have to be. 
So live your desired new future in the precious moment. So here's another of those big questions. By the way, as we are moving on, if you have any questions about any of this content, you want to have a little bit of a discussion, we can discuss this. Just let me know. All you have to do is send a message here in the Zoom or um, raise your hand and we will do our best to make sure that we get to you and we answer all of your questions. Or if you want to put it in the YouTube comments below, I can respond to you later. We can do that as well. So here's another of those big questions. If you know that by staying present and severing or pruning your connections with the past, you can have access to all the possible outcomes in the quantum field, why would you choose to live in the past and keep creating the same future for yourself? Sounds like mayhem to me. Why wouldn't you do what is already in your power to do, to mentally alter the physical makeup of your brain and your body so that you can be changed ahead of any actual desired experience. Why wouldn't you opt for living in the future of your choice now, ahead of time, instead of obsessing about some traumatic or stressful event that your fear is in your future, based on your experience of the past, obsess about a new desired experience that you haven't yet embraced emotionally. I'm gonna hit the pause button because some of you are going, well, okay, this is fine and dandy for this book. This is fantastic. However, how do I actually do that? Like today, or how do I do that? When I get up and go tomorrow, I have to go to the supermarket or I need to go to the hardware store for something for my home, or I need to go out in public, yada, yada. How do I actually implement this immediately so that this benefits me, this way of thinking, this way of being? I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm going to tell you exactly how, because this is what I did, what I do and what I have done. And the way is when you decide, when you decide that you want to, so you're going to a store or you're going to a place of employment, as an example, there's parking. Well, one of the things that I do is when I go to Bellaterra Mall here is packed all the time, no matter what. It is packed even at the height of the recession when it opened, you couldn't find parking. But what do I do when I go to the Bellaterra Mall? There's a specific parking spot that is my favorite parking spot. It's right next to where the postal workers park, which is empty most 99% of the time. I love this parking spot because it's right across from where I get my manicures and pedicures done. It's right, right there, close to, to Costco. It's just a great parking spot. It's easy to get in and then I can take the back street out where I don't have to go through all the traffic and all the mayhem of the main mall. I can go through the backside in between Costco and this parking structure. So it's like a little quick getaway where I don't have to deal with all the menagerie of cars there. So I call it my princess parking spot. So before, as I'm driving over, I already, I already visualize and I'm already, oh my gosh, I'm going to get princess parking. It's astounding to me. For a while, I used to tell my best friend about it. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's like 10 times in a row. Now it happens every single time. So now it's like, it's not that it's not a big deal because I still, it always puts a smile on my face. I think about it before I go. I anticipate getting my princess parking spot. I intend it because I intend it and I expect it. Guess what? I get the princess parking, even though there might be a line of cars ahead of me, there might be a line of cars, you know, opposite from me and something miraculously happened that even though the spot might be taken as I'm pulling in, just as I'm pulling up, the car ahead of me moves and whoever's in that spot pulls out and boom, I'm able to slip in. And I got to tell you that has saved me a lot of time a lot of time. So that's one, one tiny little thing that you could start with. I mean, you could do it with red lights and green lights. It's like, if you normally get a lot of red lights when you're driving, you're going, you could just intend, my gosh, I'm so lucky every time I get on, you know, Beach Boulevard, every time I get on whatever main street, main highway, I always get all the green lights because it saves you time and that feels good. And as you see it happening every single time, you're going to notice it's like, wow, that's not a coincidence. You know, it, it's a sign that you are using your 5D, you're tapping into the quantum and you're putting that intention. The 5D, the divine is actually taking your order because you don't doubt it. You are willing to surrender to that thought and accept it as true. 
it comes to pass. So allow yourself to live in that potential new future now to the extent that your body begins to accept or believe that you're experiencing that elevated emotions of that future outcome in the present moment. You're going to learn how to do this. Remember when I said that my daughter needed to live her present life like she'd already had experiences of that great summer in Italy? By doing that, she was broadcasting into the quantum field that the event had already physically occurred. The greatest people in the world have demonstrated this. Thousands of so-called ordinary people have done it, and you can as well. You have all the neurological machinery to transcend time, to make this a skill. Did you hear that? He says here, you have all the neurological machinery to transcend time. What some might call miracles, I describe as cases of individuals working towards changing their state of being so that their bodies and mind are no longer merely a record of their past, but become active partners, taking new steps to a new and better future. Isn't that exciting? I got to tell you, for me, this is so true. Like uh, Gia, as she created her Italy trip, she wanted to go for six weeks. You, you heard the story. I did the same thing. It took me longer than her, of course, because I had dreamt about this for over a decade and I didn't know how I was going to do it, how I was going to pull it all together. But I had a clear picture of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to see, the different places that I wanted to actually live there for months at a time, which I ended up doing. And at the least expected moment in time, all of a sudden, all the doors, like a year before I actually went, I was pricing out tickets. I've been pricing out all sorts of different places throughout the world, but definitely, you know, tickets to Italy and all sorts of different things. And as, you know, things started to coalesce and I had, you know, and I would daydream a lot about it as I would, um, daydream, night dream, whatever you want to call it. I would add an elevated emotion, knowing that it was going to take place, talk a lot about it to my best friend as if it had already happened. And then sure enough, I'll never forget the week where it was really a strong possibility. Instead of just kind of more of a pie in the sky kind of wishful thing, it became a very possible reality and everything came together for me to put that trip together which lasted the better part of half a year and i was able to go live live there for the last half of 2019 and so if i could do it you could do it no question about it and the formula is in here so transcending the big three peak experiences and ordinary altered states of consciousness. So at this point, you understand that the main obstacle to breaking the habit of being yourself is thinking and feeling equal to your environment, your body and time. Obviously then learning to think and feel be greater than the big three is your first goal as you prepare for the meditation process you will learn in this book. I bet that at some point in your life, perhaps even frequently, you've already been able to think greater than your environment your body and time. These moments when you transcend the big three are what some people call being in the flow. There are a number of ways to describe what happens when our surroundings, our bodies, and our sense of time's passage disappear and we are lost to the world. In speaking to groups across the globe, I've asked audience members to describe, you know, to really describe creative moments when they were so consumed by what they were doing or were so relaxed and at ease that they seemed to enter an altered state of consciousness. I'm gonna hit the pause button right here because that state where you are so engrossed, where you have no notion of time, we've all been there, every single one of us. As children, how many of us made believe that we were Superman, Superwoman, we were cops and robbers, we were doctor and patient, we were mom and dad, we were you know, Kimba the White Lion, we were Ghost Speed Racer, we were a whole myriad of different things we made believe. We made believe that we were Peter Pan or Tinkerbell, that we were an eagle flying up in the sky, we were Lion King, whatever the case might be. You got, you were lost and totally engrossed 
didn't have a feeling of time. You were just completely submerged in that experience. As adults, we do that too. Anytime you go watch a movie, you are engrossed. You are in that. That is an, a, a trans state. What psychologists will tell you is a trans state. Neurologists will also tell you that is a trans state. That is also a hypnotic state. You are in a post-hypnotic suggestive uh, place of being. Okay. So these experiences generally fall into two categories. And the first of these are so-called peak experiences, what we think of as transcendent moments, when we attain a state of being that we associate with monks and mystics. Compared to those highly spiritual events, the others may be more mundane or ordinary and prosaic, but that doesn't mean that they aren't any less important. These ordinary moments happen to me many times, although not as often as I would like. While in the process of writing this book, when I first sat down to write, I often have many other things on my mind. My busy travel schedule, my patients, my kids, my staff, how hungry, sleepy, happy I am. On good days, when the words seem to flow out of me, it is as though my hands and my keyboard are an extension of my mind. I'm not consciously aware of my fingers moving on or my back resting against the chair. The trees swaying in the breeze outside my office disappear that a bit of stiffness in my neck no longer nudges for my attention. And I'm completely focused. I'm focused on and completely absorbed by the words of my computer and my computer screen. And at some point I realized that an hour or more has gone by in what seemed an instant. I'm going to hit the pause button right here because this is so absolutely true. A year ago, last April, mid April, I was in Colorado Springs and I had I had, I was there on a business trip. I had no intention to, uh, I, I was already writing a book and I didn't have any intention to write anything while I was in Colorado Springs, but I had three days of business and then I took the rest of the time to sightsee and so forth. And one on the fourth day, we went to Garden of the Gods of all things. I had an incredible time with a friend and it was just the most exquisite day. That whole trip was so awesome. And I just, when I came back to my room, I was like, I'm the luckiest girl alive. And I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was, you know, getting, I sat down on my bed and I was in the lotus position and I was like, thank you, God, thank you, divine. I'm like, oh my gosh, how good can this get? This is so amazing. I'm like, my life is such a spectacular, incredible, magical thing. Now, I want you to bear in mind, just two weeks before, my boyfriend and I had broken up. This was someone that I loved very, very, very dearly. So on the heels of that, here I was having this extraordinary, beautiful, wonderful experience. Yes, I did some processes to clear that up because, you know, you don't break up of a significant relationship and then skip a beat without having done some deep I had to do some pretty deep work. And if any of you are interested in what that work was, I have a, I have a video on how to get over a breakup in five steps because there were, there were five things that I did that in less, not even 24 hours, in less than 12 hours, it was remarkable to me how I felt so much freer and lighter like the next morning, which doesn't make any sense because like I said, this was a significant relationship and it was a very brutal, very abrupt ending to that relationship. So long story short, I sat down and I was in this place of just gratitude. And I was, you know, Dr. Joe says, gratitude and appreciation are the ultimate state of receivership. And he's not joking because I was just reveling and savoring and just the exquisiteness of that entire day. And here I am in this beautiful room, sitting down in my comfy bed. And I'm just like, I'm just like jazz. And then the next thing I hear, just in a brief moment of the beginning of my meditation where I'm just blank, you should write a book on friendship, which I was like, what? Write a book on friendship? To be honest with you, it took me out of that being state because it was like, it was such a tangent. I'm like, why would I do that? Oh, I'm like, okay. No, no disrespect. I know better than to argue with God or the divine, but 
clearly this was not part of my plan and the whole idea just sounded boring. So I'm not going to get into the whole story here because it's too long and that's not the purpose. The purpose is to study this book. However, this goes hand in hand with what he is saying right here, right now. So fast forward, I was brought to memory certain things in my life. And then I thought, well, okay, if I do this, it's like, gee whiz, this is definitely not my idea. It doesn't, you know, and I actually said to God, I said to the divine, I'm like, why don't you ask me to write about watching paint dry or watching grass grow? Because the book on friends, it's like, I would never go to the bookstore, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and go to the section, wherever that might be on friends and buy a book on friends. It just didn't make any sense to me. So I said, well, what would I even name the book? And then I was given the name of the book in that moment. And I thought, wait a minute, in the title, there's, I go, that might work but I'm not even sure if I know the definition of that word because that word is not in my vocabulary. It's not a word that I use. So I decided, you know what, let me pop up my computer because none of these ideas are mine. It came to me, but these are tangents. I don't think this way. So I thought I better write this down because I definitely won't remember it. So I popped up my computer. My intention was to open up my, my old book, copied it, blanked it out. So I had the template there again for me. I wrote the title that was given to me. I looked up the definition of the word and then more things were brought to mind. And I said, I better, I better write these memories down because otherwise I'm not gonna remember. So I started to write that down. Long story short, my fingers, like I didn't even know what it was that I was writing. The next thing I'm going, I am a pretty fast typer. So I was like typing, typing faster than I could really think. When I it finally slowed down, I thought, okay, well, I better get to sleep. What time is it? So I looked, I had been typing for like two and a half hours. It was like four o'clock in the morning. And I thought, four o'clock in the morning? I gotta be up at eight because we're leaving at nine. I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta get to sleep. I go, what did I write? I go, how many pages did I write? Because I had no idea what I had written because there was just supposed to be a few notes. I have no idea what I wrote. I'm like, how could I have been writing for that long? It felt like 15 minutes, maybe. I had no notion of time, but if I had to, it didn't feel like it was that long. So it was shocking to me that over two hours had gone by. So when I said, well, I'm, gosh, how many pages did I write? So I checked and I had written 24 pages. I'm like 24 pages, what could I possibly write about in 24 pages? So I said, okay, I don't have time to read it now. I'm gonna have to read it tomorrow. So then I read it tomorrow and then I realized, I'm like, okay, obviously something is trying to come through here. I'm like, okay, here's the deal. If I have to write this book because there's one person out there that needs to read this book, so be it. I'm willing to be the, the conduit, so to speak. You know, you can use my body to type this all out and I'll publish it and I'll do all that. And one person will benefit for it. That's fine. This is not for, this is not for everybody. It's for that one person. I'm cool with that because obviously it's being brought to me for a reason. So I let go of that. So that's exactly what Dr. Joe is talking about. He has all sorts of other things on his mind. I had garden of the gods, appreciation, gratitude. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the luckiest girl alive to like all of a sudden, what? You're telling me to do what? That's the type of stuff that happens. At some point I realized that an hour or more had gone by in what seemed an instant. I can relate to that. This kind of thing has likely happened to you, probably has. Perhaps while you were driving, watching a movie, enjoying dinner with good company, reading, knitting, practicing piano, or simply sitting in a quiet spot in nature. I don't know about you, but I often feel amazingly refreshed after experiencing one of those moments when my environment, my body, and time seem to disappear. They don't always happen when I'm writing, but after completing my second book, I find that they occur with greater frequency. With practice, I've been able to take control so that these experiences of being in the flow are not as accidental or serendipitous as they were at first. Overcoming the big three to facilitate the occurrence of such moments is essential for losing your mind and creating a new one. So that's the ending of chapter four. I don't know if Aaron and Natalia, if you have any questions, if you'd like to jump on your cameras and have a discussion about this. 
But I will say this, one of the things that I, I um, up until, I've always been one where I could play, play music by ear and I could, extemp just as you extemporaneously speak, I could, you know, improvise music. I could listen to the radio and play along, whether it was the piano, the flute or the guitar. And, um, but up until 2010, I had never really composed any music. And I was sitting at the beach on, uh, this was the first week of November, 2010. And I remember as I was writing down with my, my uh, I had a, a notebook with me, a journal. And as I was sitting down to write, I could actually hear music, a, a tune. I could hear a specific tune in my head. And I thought, oh, that sounds really pretty. I wonder, you know, as soon as I get back, I better write it down because otherwise I'll forget it. And, um, and then these words came to me. And so what ended up happening during that particular meditation, I actually wrote the lyrics, which I'd never done before. I wrote the lyrics to two different songs and I got the music. And so I thought, hmm, they came in pieces though. So I thought, gee whiz, I wonder, I thought, well, I'll have to see if the lyrics fit to the music once I sit down to the piano. So then I got home to the piano, sat down, I put the lyrics up and as I started to play the music that I had heard in my head and I'm now translating it out of my fingers, the lyrics fit perfectly with the music. And I thought, wow, what a trip. There's like, I'm not, you know, yeah, I took uh, music at a conservatory when I was in junior high and high school, but I'm not that sophisticated in music where I'm not a good music writer per se, um, but I can improvise music and I can definitely compose things. So I thought, wow, what are the chances that the words and the music would all fit perfectly? I thought, well, that's kind of a trip. So, so I shared the song then with my best friend. I shared it with a few other friends and they're like, well, apparently, you know, you may have not been in the past, but you are now. So fast forward, I really haven't written any music since then. And then last week, all of a sudden, I composed four songs, none of them with lyrics though, four songs. And I realized, oh, those are, that's music that I'm supposed to use with some of the videos that I edit in some of my YouTube videos. So on some of the, you'll start to hear some of that music in um, Becoming Supernatural, just in the background. It's just the background music. So you don't know what's gonna to come to you when you're tuned and tapped in and turned on like Abraham Hicks likes to say. So that is all I have for you now with regards to chapter four. And I wanna encourage you, if you haven't started yet with Dr. Joe's meditations, at the very least, go to YouTube and in the search bar, you can put in there, go love 20 meditation. It's just a 50, minute meditation. There are instructions to that meditation, not just in the description, but I can give you further instructions where you can start spreading unconditional love to people that you know, and you just start to do that every day for one person a day. You'd be surprised of the stories that inside the Dr. Joe community of advanced students that we, we've been starting to hear the benefits that people, you know, when you do these meditations, we're just doing it out, out of sheer love. We just want to broadcast love. Doesn't matter whether we know the person or not, right? So we're just broadcasting love. But what's interesting is that the, the healings that we are now starting to experience, people have had issues either with relatives, past relationships that were really sour and bad are now restored people healing from different things just from that 15 minute meditation where all they're doing is they're getting heart and brain coherence. They're connecting the two and they're just broadcasting that unconditional love to someone. Oftentimes it's to a stranger. Sometimes it's to someone that they're familiar with or an acquaintance or it's somebody that they know and love already, but it doesn't matter. The point is that they're broadcasting love. And as you do that, you know, meditation, as you do it every day, it compounds, it fans out your electromagnetic field where your electromagnetic field gets wider and bigger because your heart opens bigger and you're broadcasting a larger field of electromagnetic frequency. There's a tremendous amount of benefit to you, not just health wise, but also spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and so forth. So, 
Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets today. Chapter five is going to be on survival versus creation. And if you have any questions, be sure to put some comments below. I make sure to respond to everybody. If you would like to be affected by Go Love 20, just let me know. Let me know in the comments below and I'll be sure to have you as my subject for Go Love 20. Okay, take care. Ciao for now. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye now, guys. Natalia, Aaron, ciao.